In today's conversation, we dig into the ways that race as a social construct has and does intersect with Jewish identities and how we can make sense of those intersections today. This is Jews Talk Racial Justice with April and Tracy, a weekly show hosted by April Baskin and Tracy Guy Decker. In a complex world, change takes courage. Wholehearted relationships can keep us accountable. Okay, Tracy, I have an idea and I love that you love and trust me enough for me to say, okay, let's just start recording. I have an idea. Let's go for it. And you're like, yeah, I'm okay. To hear it. So uh, there's been some recent confusion and some interesting discussion. And I think it might be worthwhile for us to bring some clarity to a few things about whether Jews are white or not. Ooh, I have this one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I think that not exclusively, but uh, Jews of color in particular uh, have for about two decades been working on sharpening our community's analysis here. And recently a statement, uh, some statements were made in different articles or from Jewish institutions that I think created confusion. And so I thought it would just be worthwhile for us to take a few moments to clarify. Also for some context for our uh, friends and listeners, uh, first of all, thank you as always, we love you. And um, we have a lot going on right now. As a number of you may already know, we've recently launched a Facebook group and we're just starting to nurture and get that off the ground. And we launched, we finally launched um, Racial Justice Launchpad and yay! Woohoo! So hopefully you got that email or saw it through social media. If not, feel free to um, look up more information on at uh, Joyous Justice's Facebook page and um you can sign up for our list to get more information or go to joyousjustice.com, but the information is out in the ether and um, we're offering a value pack masterclass, lots of exciting things. So a lot is happening right now. So um, I'm also hoping for this, this video may be, although at times I've endeavored this and we haven't achieved it, but that this is just going to be a pithy, clear episode today. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's been some debate here and I just wanted to clarify a few things and I wanted you to clarify a few things, Tracy. And I, the first thing I want to do is just make a distinction between the way Jews have been classified over time and that that changes mm -hmm. over time. And I'm noticing some of this is getting conflated here and, and mm -hmm. just things are getting a little muddled. And there's uh, value and insight and um, real truth in parts of it, but things are getting blurred and I want to clean it up a little bit. So as I often like to stay, I'll say, I'll start by saying, um, oh, and about whether Jews are a race or not. Uh, so first of all, as a number of folks may or may not know, race is a construct. It's a social construct as are a number of things. And by basically all sociological standards, Jews are not a race. Jews are a multiracial people. Um, we are known among, uh, this is post my education, but I hear some young folks talking about how we're an ethno religion. I really like the word people. Some rabbis have referred to us as a, a family, which to me is a variation on uh, a people. And we are a multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural people. And in today's modern age, the majority of Jews in America, so there's a significant portion of Jews who are Jews of color, and then the majority around uh, 70 so percent or so, slightly more, slightly less, depending upon which statistics you look at, are white Jews. From my sociological anal analysis and education at times to be more precise and to acknowledge some of the ambivalence Jews have, about the subject, I will say uh, Jews have been granted conditional whiteness in America, but they are still read and received as white. And as a number of Jews of color articulate, um, they experience racism that in some ways is different and also very similar between white Gentiles and white Jews. Um, and so those similarities are worth noting. Um, so I wanted to just clear 
provide some clarity on that front. And there are a few other pieces. Tracy, I want to, what do you want to contribute to the conversation? I, there are a few potential entry points. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of entry points. I feel like, um, well, two things that are occurring to me, one is I want to reiterate something that actually you have said, April, which is that the question when white Jews say, I'm not white, I'm Jewish, they're actually buying into the binary of white or not white. Um, and it's actually, it's more complicated than that. It's there, there is conditional whiteness. The other thing that I wanted that's coming up for me is that I recently had this you know, I love my metaphors. I, I recently had a metaphor come to me um, that was really helpful for me. So maybe this will be clarifying from science where we know that if you only understand light as particles, then you totally miss what wavelengths, light wavelengths do, light waves mm -hmm. do. If you only think about light waves, then you miss what um, photons mm -hmm. I think light particles are called photons, then you miss that what photons can do, right? And it's both, right? And sometimes it behaves like a wave and you can use the physics so of waves to describe it. And sometimes it behaves like particles and you can use the physics of particles to describe it. And I think Jewishness and therefore the things that follow Jewishness, including anti-Semitism, are also like that, where sometimes it behaves like just like a religion. Sometimes it behaves just like an mm -hmm. ethnicity. Um, but specifically Ashkenazi or Sephardim or Mizrahim, like the, those are the ethnicities. It's not Jewish. It's, it's more granular and than sometimes that. even more granular um, than that when you start to get into national or like regional around Indian versus exactly. West African versus Chinese and language and yeah, yeah language yeah. customs, culture. Um, and, and similarly with antisemitism, then it follows. And sometimes antisemitism behaves like, a religious, uh, bias. And sometimes anti-Semitism behaves like more like a, an, an ethnic yeah. or a racial bias. Oh, that's so Race good. A construct, as God, you say. I love your brain, Tracy. And, <laughs> so good. And for me, when I kind of made that connection between light and Jewishness, it like it just really helped me sort of see <sighs> like those of us who are arguing like, no, it's a religion. And others are like, no, it's a culture. Like right. it is both. Exactly. And therefore it has the, it, and and sometimes it interacts with other religions and sometimes it interacts with other or races and like it just it, yeah or or ethnicities and so that sort of recognizing oh, you mean, you mean that, that sometimes it embodies context? i thought i thought you meant like the like the jewish people were interacting with people of other races or other you meant at, at times it i mean like sociologically like when people obviously it's people it's people who are carrying right no no i just the, i misunderstood or the... i thought you were saying something different and but anyway so yeah so sorry please continue I, I mean, I think that I've, that, that's, that's basically the, the metaphor that I wanted to articulate that for me, and this is just within the past couple of weeks that I kind of had that connection, um, thinking about, and I was actually, it started for me thinking about antisemitism. And I realized that it's not that antisemitism behaves like a wave or a particle. It's actually that Judaism mm -hmm. does. And therefore the biases against mm -hmm. it behave like waves and particles. Um, anyway, uh, that, so that's, both of those things. One, that it's not an either or white or not white. There, There is such a thing as conditional whiteness because race is a construct. And two, it's a wave and a particle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it goes back into what we've talked about in other episodes too, uh, about I think some of the complexity and the denial and the difficulty that white Ashkenazi Jews have at times with their proximity and assimilation around their oppressor and a resistance around acknowledge around being very aware that that isn't, there isn't full integration from the outside and even from the inside in certain ways of what the conversations I've heard around the table of, ah, well, you know, things are as they are, or like that's a statement in alignment that aligns with whiteness. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. one piece. And then the last thing I think, or I'm endeavoring it to be the last thing is, uh, you know, it's never last. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. The second to last thing, we should start saying the second to last thing is the second to last thing is also, I just wanted to name something about timelines that I've, I'm a timeline yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, some of these concepts over time. And 
the importance to get clear uh, that something can could have been contextualized in a particular way at a specific point in time, and that we can acknowledge and honor that and also grapple with. And I think this is also part of it, the heart, which was made the situation recently with Whoopi Goldberg so complicated for some folks, because there's a way in which that can be unpacked and honored. And we can also hold that in contemporary times, in this moment, there is a very, a vastly different reality. And as I spoke a lot about in the video, what makes that complicated is because energy and feeling wise for a lot of Jews, there's still a lot of unhealed pain and trauma around the Holocaust. But something that I want to say very lovingly and thoughtfully is that, was that weird for folks when I just totally changed my tone, went into a different zone? <laughs> Yeah, switch, switched up, code switching in real time, energy, vibe, vibe switching uh, is, I'm still chewing on this. I thought, I thought a few, th about a few things related to this, but I saw a lot of people online saying, here's what the Nazis said we were. And what I want to put forth is, yes, that is worth witnessing and acknowledging and that doesn't necessarily mean that that is that that's how we should that that should be the basis for how we think about our sociological yeah. identity it's one thing to understand and i think more of that will come with more healing over time but like there's a way in which i know and i at times have taught and i do teach historically the ways, and I think part of this also, I'll just briefly say, I think is also about proximity and a, an epiphany I had the other day when I was riding in the car with my partner, which has nothing to do with it, but that's just where I had the epiphany. I remember we were driving through a puddle and I was like, ah, oh, something clicked for me <laughs> of like, oh, but the Shoah, the Holocaust was a lot more recent. So black folks have the advantage of having had more time and closer proximity to earth-based cultures and different things that allowed for healing. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is when I put it on myself and my, there are certain ways. And I, again, so I, I, I educate people around this. That's where I was going. Um, and I'm very aware of the ways that slave masters and captors described black identity mm -hmm. and often wretchedness mm -hmm. and other things, but that's not what I use. That's not what black people use today as a basis to sociologically analyze that, that they, that is contextualized in the context of a history of their experience, but that is not used to be a part of the predominant narrative when advocating for how we should be seen by the world. Right, right. Our oppression is a part of who we are, that experience yes. of being oppressed, but I, I don't want it to define. Thank you. That's I what am. I'm trying to get to. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it needs to be acknowledged and witnessed and, and hopefully healed, but I do not want it to, I don't want it to define who I am or how I yeah. show up. And there's not a rush yeah. around this. It's not a tomorrow thing, but I think it's important that we clean this up because I think our lack of clarity externally to the broader world for those who are listening and have some analysis can be a little confusing. Yes. I think it also can make for problems internally, yes. right? I think yes. when you, you use the phrase return default to factory settings, when people get mm -hmm. agitated, um, which I think is a really great, like telegraphing of what happens. Part of factory settings when we get scared is a, like a primordial reliance on in-group and out-group preference, right? In-group preference, out-group bias, so that we prefer people who are in our group because they're safe, right? But for Jews, if we don't recognize that in-group status is not about how we look, like we are destined to tear ourselves apart and, and in the end, mm. like exclude and, and further marginalize our own people, people who are our right. in-group. And I, that, so I think that, that feels like a really important thing to acknowledge that it is told, it is human and normal to have in-group bias. It is part mm -hmm. of our, like survival strategy from 
you know, from way back from pre-language yeah. days, but we're not pre-language <laughs> and we need to, as a people, embrace the fact that our in-group is not about people who look like me. And I'm, I'm speaking directly, like look like me with white skin and dark hair and Ashkenazi features. Like that's not it. That can't be it. It's not only it. It's a lot more. It's been a lot more historically. It will be a lot more in the future. Tracy, that was really good. Thank yeah. God. Thank and God. so good. And, and thank God in the sense that humanity is amazing. And one of the things, one of the many, many, many things I love about Judaism and our Jewish people is that Jews truly encapsulate the, the beauty and the breadth of the entire human experience. And increasingly we are moving in the direction and I want us to continue to move in that direction of steadily embracing that more and more. And the more we embrace it, as is often the case with inclusion, it is not just about, oh, it's nice for them. It is mm -mm, healing mm -mm. and empowering and opens up different narratives and insights and analysis and humor and possibilities for what it means to be Jewish and human today. The, 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 um, the metaphor that's coming up for me now is about like the, I don't know the word, what is it? Nusach? Is that the, the name of like the sound, the song, the melodies? Like, I know, I know that cantors um, face a lot of pushback when they try to introduce oh. a new melody for one of our <laughs> liturgical songs. Yo. I know you do. Yeah, I for know. real. And also like, I think about how my worship experience has been enriched <laughs> when I have learned new melodies. And I'm not singing the same Lecha Dodi every single week. Like it's, it, I, it feels like a very resonant metaphor that like, sometimes it's a little uncomfortable because this other thing, our is, brain needs to get used to melody it. Melody is super familiar. Mm -hmm. You gotta, you kind of gotta get used to it, but it is so much better and richer when there are other, you know, other ways of expressing, even if it's the same words, it just, it just changes the whole experience and, and opens up new insights and new avenues for connecting with the divine, for connecting with each other, for connecting across yeah. lines of religious and peoplehood difference. Um, and, and for the record, I am not particularly musical. So <laughs> if I, if I misstated something like it's, it is it's ignorance. Good. Um, but I, I do enjoy like liturgical singing is absolutely my favorite time for me to sing. Um, and I know, I know that my liturgical experience, my worship experience is enriched when I'm not singing only the melodies that I learned when I was 10. Word up. So here's what I would say is that I think, I think a part of a point was missed with Whoopi and I get why, because there's a lot of pain in history there. I think if she just rephrased it and said they were both peoples of European heritage, I think that's really what, that's a different way of saying what she was trying to say. And, um, and what I would say, so based upon to kind of draw everything to a close now, you know, um, a lot of American Jews are white. And if it makes you more comfortable to say conditionally white, even better, e even, even better for bonus points in the coming years, if you're willing to go on a journey with us and with other folks around starting to disassemble and release some of the parts of that whiteness and more fully embrace Jewishness outside of a paradigm of racism and start to embrace a different liberatory approach. Um, that's amazing. And in the meantime, a bunch of us are white. The descendants of the Shoah who survived um, are classified as white in America today and or conditionally white. Um, to the point that a lot of people were, are making at times online, I would say it in a slightly different way and agree. Historically or during that period in Germany, even though oftentimes the same, there was a similar, uh, at times even ethnic, but uh, not exactly ethnic, but a national and uh, regional identity, right? Like, you know, the, the people, you know, shared European heritage, Jews were classified, were dehumanized and were explicitly um, uh, described as not being white. 
Um, but I noticed that when people talk about it online, they're kind of blurring then and now, and they're very mm -hmm. different moments and dynamics playing and out. So that's the clarification for me. As I'm not saying people are all wrong, but I'd, I'd love for us to have a bit more precision. Yes, Tracy. I, I, well, I, I just want to come back to your point that race is a social construct. And so it's, it's constantly yeah. changing in the same way that like in, um, you know, in, in Jim Crow South, like race changed, even if you cross state lines, because in one state, they would describe it as, you know, one great grandparent. And in the state next door, it was only one grandparent or whatever the specific details were, but because it is a social construct, you could be you know, at certain times in, in America, you could be one race in one state, cross the state line, and you're considered a different race. That's, that's how completely constructed it is. And to the Germans, to the Nazis, to the Nazis, Jews, it was a race. Yes. That's not the way that today in America, Jews are, we are treated. Uh, Jews of European, of solo European heritage are racialized in an American context today. As, yeah. Well, the, American construction of race is much less granular mm -hmm. than the Nazis mm -hmm. was. I mean, it's in part because it needs sort of more diversity, right? Like that's, but that, that's a whole other episode. But I think it's fascinating because I think you can look across different parts of the world and where things play out differently, like in South Africa versus the States versus Germany around mm -hmm. the time of the Holocaust. In general, race actually is pretty, cons racism is relatively consistent. It just morphs in certain ways or certain categories more so that the power group, right? It gets more granular right. in Germany where, you know, it's about the, the different specifics once you look at things. So like for instance, in, in a lot of parts of Africa, I, uh, in certain parts of Africa, like in South Africa, I would be classified as colored or basically very proximate right. to white because that serves racism in that context because most people are black. So in that scenario, they want to include as many people as they can as a part to buffer, to serve as a, a buffer. Whereas in the States, since mm -hmm. at least, in, so I would, the last piece we can finally end on is for future, <laughs> is for future reference. I would bet, I would guess, not bet, I don't bet, but um, I don't gamble, but I would guess, I have a hypothesis that as America begins to diversify, and, we, and, and I think a number of sociologists, I can hear them in my mind saying, this is already happening that certain groups of people who have been traditionally categorized as people of color will also start to gain access to conditional whiteness to keep the power dynamics occurring, which doesn't mean that we're still not going to ultimately triumph and lovingly, gently overthrow all of this oppression. But people are going to try in different ways because it's, it's a classic playbook move from all global, from patterns that I've seen around how racism manifests globally in different parts of the planet. So all of that being said, race is a construct, but what is not a construct? The world around are cultures and histories. And I like to end on a positive note, so <laughs> squeezing this in in the last few minutes. <laughs> so um, if you're like, oh, this is all, ugh, um, if folks are interested in that, let us know, you know, like, we get to lean back on our cultures and our histories and our narratives that bring us joy and take time and heal and reflect upon the parts that have been painful and the meaning and the purpose uh, that we are drawing from that. And those things overlap with, but also can exist entirely outside of a paradigm of racism. Um, and we get to claim that and hold that and carry that forward as we continue to move in the direction of collective liberation. Thanks for tuning in. Our show's theme music was composed by Elliot Hammer. You can find this track and other beats on Instagram at Elliot Hammer. If this episode resonated with you, please share it and subscribe. To join the conversation, visit JewsTalkRacialJustice.com where you can send us a question or suggestion, access our show notes, and learn more about our team. Take care until next time and Stay humble and keep going.